delighted to be the host uh, of today's session. You'll be seeing me, no doubt, throughout the rest of the day. But for now, I'm going to hand over to our first round of speakers. Um, the theme of their, their session is towards an, uh, excuse me, apologies, is focused on climate finance to support adaptation of basic services and to build community resilience, a topic of real importance, I'm sure you will agree. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Patrick Mariotti. He is the CEO of IRC and we'll take over from here. Thank you. in Glasgow and joining from other places around the world. It's a real pleasure to be here with you for this event. My name is Patrick Moriarty, and I'm the chair of the Sanitation and Water for All Steering Committee, and the chief executive officer of one of its members, IRC WASH, an independent non-profit organization that drives resilient WASH systems from the ground up. So, Thank you for joining us today at this event, Climate Finance to Support Adaptation of Basic Services and Build Community Resilience, Water, Sanitation and Hygiene. And firstly, let me extend a very special welcome to the Honourable Minister of Lands, Agriculture, Fisheries, Water and Rural Development from Zimbabwe, uh, Honourable Dr. AJ Masuka. And on behalf of sanitation water for all. I would also like to thank all of our partners and co-conveners for this session. So that's water.org, UNICEF, and the governments of the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. And thank you all for your support in helping us to organize this event. So I think uh, I'm just gonna talk as briefly through the agenda for the event. Uh, Hopefully you can, that's up on the slide, but basically uh, we'll have a, uh, this opening session. We're going to hear briefly from our Chief Executive Officer of Sanitation and Water for All, uh, Katarina de Albuquerque. And then we'll go into a, a panel discussion uh, moderated by Gary White from water.org. And I think we'll have about 25 minutes of that and then followed by hopefully about 10 minutes Q&A. So as you're listening to that, I hope you uh, all line your questions up and, and then we'll have some closing remarks. So we've got about 45 minutes together and I think it's going to be a really exciting and uh, stimulating event. So look, we're all here this week, whether we're in person or, or virtually, because we know that decisive action to address climate change is urgent for the future of the planet, for ourselves, for our children. And while we have to continue and strengthen the global efforts to reduce greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases, we also need to recognize that for those in the most precarious situations, climate change is already happening and it's already impacting their lives and their livelihoods. So ensuring sustainable water and sanitation services is absolutely critical in this regard. I don't think I need to convince many of us here, but it's worth saying at the start. And why is it critical? It's critical because building resilience, it's critical to building resilience because these are essential services to households, to men, women, and children, but they're also fundamental to so many other services. And whether that's education or healthcare or just broad economic development. And yet, as we all know, investment in water, sanitation and hygiene, including through climate finance, remains woefully inadequate. And I'd add that the political priority given to water, sanitation and hygiene remains woefully adequate. So at today's event, we have an opportunity to reframe how we characterize these challenges. We should start by inverting the role of water, sanitation, hygiene in climate resilience and action. Too often, we hear about water, sanitation and hygiene services being affected by changes in climate, by droughts or by floods or by hurricanes that damage these services. But today's conversation is about turning that around, about cl providing clear examples of how water, good and resilient water, sanitation and hygiene underpin resilient livelihoods as part of a comprehensive resilience package. 
And so I think today we have three principal objectives. First, we want to highlight the cost benefits of building the resilience of infrastructure assets and basic social services, such as water, sanitation and hygiene in low and middle income countries. And we do this by building the complementarities and synergies between water, food and energy. Secondly, we're emphasizing how climate resilience and water, sanitation and hygiene align with and feed into the broader climate rationale. And thirdly, we're describing new avenues, tangible ones, to team up and work with financiers and the private sector. So with this, I'm really excited to get the conversation started. And I, we're going to kick off now with a message from Katerina uh, de Albuquerque, our, our Chief Executive Officer of Sanitation and Water for All. Over to you, Katerina. Greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Katarina Albuquerque and I'm the CEO of the Sanitation and Water for All uh, Global Partnership where we work to eliminate inequalities in the enjoyment of the human rights to water and sanitation in order to ensure universal access for everyone, always and everywhere until uh, 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, if we look uh, at the map uh, of who still lacks access to safe drinking water, sanitation and hygiene, and as you know, it's billions of people around the world, we will still see that there is a considerable overlap uh, with those communities who are most vulnerable to a variety of serious uh, climate threats, such as prolonged droughts, floodings and sea level rise. For us, it's a clear that we cannot deliver on universal access to water, sanitation and hygiene without assuring accelerated action on climate change. In order to accelerate, sufficient resources must be uh, devoted to this global challenge. However, the 100 billion US dollars a year committed that developed countries have promised uh, to deliver on climate finance for developing countries has failed to materialize. We also see that private finance is not flowing to developing countries in the amounts that the world needs. And the money that is available is overwhelmingly directed towards mitigation to forestall increasingly worse impacts of climate change on our world. This is of course important, but equally important is the fact that those most vulnerable uh, populations who I just mentioned, their lives, their livelihoods and their survival is impacted by climate change in the here and in the now, particularly in terms of access to water, sanitation and hygiene. Financing adaptation must be a priority if we are to respond to the needs of those in the most perilous circumstances. Currently, adaptation continues uh, only to receive approximately one quarter of total uh, public climate finance. The unevenness is not only an issue of mitigation and adaptation. Within adaptation, there are also disparities. For instance, a recent uh, water aid uh, report revealed that an estimated one tenth of climate finance for water related projects is directed towards the adaptation needs for basic water, sanitation and hygiene, accounting for just 0.3% of total global climate finance. Ladies and gentlemen, water, sanitation and hygiene are, we all know it, an indispensable uh, element of building climate resilient communities, particularly for those who are the most marginalized. As a matter of human rights, states must assess their overall available water resources, dwindling in many places as a result of climate change, as we know, and ensure that in prioritizing allocation of different water uses, the water needed for the realization of human rights, including the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation, is the first need that is met. I'm going to explain how climate resilient wash aligns with and feeds into broader climate rationale in countries and discuss new avenues to team up with work, team up the work with financiers and the private sector, as I mentioned. So we have a, a well-rounded group today 
we'll have uh, the Honorable Minister Dr. Masuka, who was mentioned previously, Alejandro Jimenez, who's the director of WASH at the Stockholm International Water Institute, Sam Godfrey, who's the WASH advisor for UNICEF's Eastern and Southern Regional Office, and Kathleen Dominique, uh, who is a finance lead for OECD's water program. So they'll each have four minutes to, to present, and then we'll go into the, the Q&A after that. So uh, Dr. Masuka, I think uh, you're ready. And, and in, Zimbabwe, in, in Zimbabwe, the government and key development partners are working on a climate proposal to the Green Climate Fund that makes emphasis on the complementarity and synergies of building food and water security. Now, can you please tell us more about how that initiative is unfolding? Well, thank you very much for the strategic question, Chair. It is a great pleasure for me to be part of this session and contribute to the important discussion on WASH and climate change financing. As you might be aware, in Zimbabwe, the primary challenge faced by vulnerable local communities in rural areas is limited access to water of sufficient quality and quantity to maintain food and water security. And climate change is uh, exacerbating this challenge with rising temperatures and increasingly variable patterns of uh, low rainfall already impacting negatively on this sector. So climate change has contributed to the decline in diversity in production and in productivity in Zimbabwe and I think across Southern Africa as well. And this has caused uh, decreasing food availability to our households and leading to sufficient insufficient calorific and vitamin intake and contributing to malnutrition and uh, there is also a decrease in the food uh, availability but we need to look at water sanitation and hygiene differently uh, i think collectively the impact of decreasing uh, availability of water in both agriculture and wash se sectors is compounding the existing socio-economic challenges that we see in Zimbabwe. The government of Zimbabwe has, however, made a start, and uh, we are trying to build climate resilient and sustainable development and the impacts we can see uh, increasing poverty levels and reducing health and well-being of communities, particularly marginalized. Oh, Dr. Masuka, would you, would you like to turn your camera on? I don't know if you realize your camera's off. <laughs> particularly marginalized groups such as women and the youth, uh, uh, youth. While numerous actions have been taken by government and other entities to address these challenges, many have been implemented using the silo and centralized approaches. And there is therefore an urgent need to improve the cross-sectoral and decentralized management of water resources in Zimbabwe to ensure food and water security as part of a bigger plan to trigger climate resilient development. And as you might be aware, 70% of our population resides in communal areas. So the overall objective uh, is to develop a GCF submission to strengthen the food and water security of vulnerable communities um, under changing climate conditions through an integrated water resources management approach. And this is a coordinated management of water, land, and other natural resources. This will be achieved simultaneously enhancing agricultural production through climate smart agriculture and maximizing the impacts of healthy food and the healthy practices through improved water and sanitation services. And to ensure these services are climate resilient, they have to be adapted to the local risks. And then strengthening integrated water resource management in agriculture and the water sanitation and hygiene sectors will facilitate the enhanced socio-economic welfare of targeted communities and improve their capacities to adapt to climate change. And the government of Zimbabwe has already identified climate smart agriculture as a national priority for addressing the impacts of climate change on food production in the country. While this is crucial for improving food security and community resilience in Zimbabwe, water sanitation hygiene service provision is equally important and it is in this regard that uh, we think that without enhancing wash services the benefits of food production will not be maximized so the proposed approach would thus help shift adaptation strategies away from the business as usual silo approaches to a more integrated water resources management that incorporates cross-sectoral ending decentralized 
approaches to community development. So the government of Zimbabwe is working with the FAO and collaborating with uh, various other partners to develop this GCF proposal, which we hope will enhance wash activities, uh, climate, uh, smart agriculture, and above all, ensure that uh, the communities, the 70% of our population can be mainstreamed in the more resilient wash and climate smart agriculture way. Thank you very much. Dr. Masuda, thank you for that. That, that was a really great uh, overview of, of kind of how you are really leaning into, into this issue, and we appreciate that. Now, uh, to keep the, the pace up and stay on, on schedule, uh, I want to bring in Alejandro Jimenez uh, here. I see we have him on the screen. So, uh, Alejandro, how is the WASH sector strengthening its capacity on issues that relate to climate change? Uh, you know, where are you, uh, where do you think we are in terms of developing risk analysis, uh, investment pipeline, and those other mechanisms that we're going to need to to scale up finance? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Gary, and uh, good morning to everyone. As a short of time, I'll go straight to the point. Uh, from our side, we have been uh, supporting over 15 countries this, this year with uh, a number of uh, aspects related to strengthening water and sanitation into into climate right but for me the first the first point would be to to lay the policy foundations for climate finance and what i mean by that is uh, improving the climate policy landscape and how the climate policies are dealing with uh, water issues and also how water policies are dealing with climate aspects. It is uh, of crucial importance this year, the, the work on the NDCs, not the National Determined Contributions, to see how water and sanitation elements can be brought into, into those commitments as well as the uh, in the national adaptation plans. This policy landscape is going to help us to have the good uh, entry points uh, to then develop more concrete proposals uh, moving forward. That is one element. Another element is to, to pl place this in the, into the climate finance analysis for the country. What is being financed, by whom, uh, what kind of projects were, the different mechanisms, what are the agencies that are accredited, uh, how do they coordinate with each other, where do we find the gaps? And that is then uh, another element. And all these help us then uh, to, to work on that uh, very famous climate rationale, right? How, how they, then the countries conduct uh, a risk analysis, seeing what are the, the climate uh, risks that uh, uh, affect in the various how uh, it can be done a uh, good uh, options appraisal to see which are the um, the interventions that can uh, help uh, mitigate the risk in a, in the best uh, possible way. So, from our side, we have been working along these lines, and what we can see so far is that uh, the new wave of policy documents, particularly national determined contributions that have been presented these days, will see a greater presence of water. Uh, compared to the previous round. Then the challenge is uh, how do we make this uh, turn into concrete finance and, and concrete uh, avenues of funds for, for, for projects at the country level. And I think with this, I can hand over to you and the next speakers, will, which uh, will give us uh, a few more examples about this. Thank you. Hey, great. Thank you, Alejandro. Well, well said. A nice segue into to Sam Godfrey. Uh, so, Sam, how how has the water sector been exploring avenues to team up with new types of financiers uh, and you know the private sector? Thank you very much, Gary, um, and good uh, good afternoon from uh, from Nairobi. Um, as you know, the UNICEF Global Strategic Plan uh, has placed climate resilient wash as a, a central uh, change strategy. Um, and here in Eastern Southern Africa, we've undertaken a fiscal analysis which reveals uh, that we require around $15 billion annually till 2030 uh, to, to meet the, the WASH SDG 6.1 and 6.2 targets across the 21 countries in Eastern Southern Africa. And interestingly, of that, uh, 10 billion of it is for basic service level provision, 
And five billion of it is for climate resilience. So the actual adaptation that's needed for the technology. So the first thing I just wanted to focus on in my brief intervention is, you know, what really makes uh, a climate resilient water supply more expensive? What are the components? And I would say that there are really three components which are important for the financing. The first of them really is securing that sustainable water resource that was mentioned by a previous speaker. And many of that in the context of Eastern Southern Africa needs water transversal schemes, moving water from one side um, of a district or a province to another, and even exploring deeper and rechargeable groundwater supplies to be able to extract groundwater that's sustainable uh, throughout droughts and floods. The second is really the investment in material quality and innovation. As we know, um, many of the water systems that are built uh, across the Eastern Southern Africa region um, are using HDPE uh, plastic tanks, which as we know, are very prone to distortion, uh, material distortion due to the increased temperatures and the PV intensity. And there's a need to replace them with steel and steel water tanks. And the third is really the integration of renewable energy um, in water um, innovations, such as, for example, biosensors, um, to manage the quantity and quality uh, of those systems and also to reduce, of course, the overall CO2 footprint. So to achieve these, of course, we need various partners. And one of the key things that we've been focusing on here in Eastern Southern Africa is how can we involve um, the private sector as a partner and a, and a financier uh, in the elaboration of these types of climate uh, resilient water supply projects. And I think the first uh, experience that we've had with this is that we have tried to identify key DFIs, so DFIs that are locally putting in uh, commercial finance uh, to the, the water se uh, and sanitation sector. And uh, in 2019, we established uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Development Bank of Southern Africa to uh, elaborate a project pipeline where the project pipelines would be submitted to the Green Climate Fund uh, by the DBSA uh, with UNICEF um, as an implementing entity through its country office programs. Um, that particular pipeline of projects, of course, then needed to have a variety of different um, partners engaged. And to date, we've developed uh, five different country submissions, including contributions to the submission mentioned by the Honorable Minister from, from Zimbabwe. But for those uh, submissions to work and those to be financed, uh, particularly by the Green Climate Fund, there is often a need to integrate the private sector uh, into the concept uh, development. So in 2020, um, we launched actually a market assessment to try to identify uh, private sector partners who could contribute financially and technically to climate adaptation projects within this pipeline. And the request for proposal was completed and two companies were actually selected and these two companies um, were then assigned particular countries within the, the region to concept proof both the material and the technology innovations through essentially a form of de-risking where they were able to place their own finance behind the actual business plans that were developed for the project pipeline, which enabled us, of course, to then submit uh, specific projects through the Development Bank of Southern Africa to the Green Climate Fund. So just to finish then going forward, I think one recommendation from our side here in Nairobi is that in order for climate finance to work at scale, we really need uh, during the COP a discussion around multi-country climate finance submissions. Um, water, of course, as we know, is transboundary in nature um, and its management is not dependent, of course, on one individual NDA. It does depend on multiple countries and multiple NDAs. And we feel it's very important that coming out of the discussions on financing, there is a recognition that we need to have multi-country proposals, which will enable us to deliver climate finance in WASH at scale. Thanks very much, Gary. Thanks, Sam, I appreciate that. And we're gonna move right along so that we have time for some Q&A. So Kathleen, uh, so we've discussed a lot already. Uh, and what would you say is the OECD's advice uh, to the sector to, to strike this right balance between adaptation uh, and mitigation. And, you know, coming off the September meeting uh, roundtable, I think that you had with OECD, any, any new insights there to, to share? Yeah, thank you very much, Gary, and uh, greetings to everyone. And thanks so much to the organizers. This is a really timely discussion and 
Very happy to be here. Um, a couple of really key um, clear messages that came from the roundtable that we had in September was that there are many, many ways that financing for water security, including WASH, contributes to climate action. That's adaptation, resilience, but also mitigation, which gets a, a lot less attention. The roundtable also highlighted the need for both more climate finance for water. So we've heard some statistics about that and that those allocations remain pretty, pretty modest, but also more financing for water that contributes to climate action. So any of the financing that's flowing into those systems really should be uh, linking to and being explicit about how they're, they're uh, contributing to climate action. In terms of the financing opportunities, especially to some examples, a lot of practical examples shared at the roundtable meeting, uh, we see several. So one is, is tapping into opportunities to mobilize finance through that, strate that increasing strategic focus on climate action from governments, development banks, dedicated climate funds. That can, that can be a big opportunity for water. It can also be a bit of a risk. Um, that requires that uh, those working on wash and water continue to make strong linkages to show explicitly how those investments contribute to climate action and how financing wash aligns with uh, Paris as that gets the Paris Agreement, as that gets more and more political attention. Still, on that front, there's a lot to be done. As mentioned, uh, the 100 billion target uh, for climate finance uh, has not been met. Uh, that's the uh, commitment from developing developed countries to developing countries. The latest OECD estimates highlight that that goal will probably not be reached until 2023. Uh, also, we know that only about one in four of those dollars is going to adaptation and there's a need to out reallocate the financing to put um, uh, adaptation financing on par with a government's commitments to put adaptation on par with mitigation, but also importantly to lower barriers to dedicated uh, climate finance and practical approaches to aligning finance with, with Paris. Now, Gary, you mentioned at the very beginning uh, ways to look for new opportunities for, from the bottom up, and we saw that also at the roundtable meeting, looking for ways to generate new revenue streams, for example, through blue carbon credit markets, uh, using insurance and risk financing approaches, attracting new types of financiers who are looking for um, environmental and climate related uh, opportunities, uh, for example, through use of proceeds bonds. We had many new and emerging initiatives shared uh, at the roundtable, including Climate Investor 2, that's a blended fund, uh, forest resilience bonds to deal with wildfire risk, environmental impact bonds uh, for, for water. And then we also see development partners like USAID making very targeted investments in cost savings, uh, wash efficiency improvements, and, and making the case about how this contributes to climate action. Let me just say one last point before I close, uh, because for many developing countries, uh, notably the LDCs, financing needs and challenges are really significant and the opportunities to mobilize private finance are more limited. And here, scaling up the development financing flows is really crucial. And I just wanna highlight one important announcement, a declaration that was made from the OECD Development Assistance Committee members just a few days ago. And they have committed now to ensure that all development cooperation, all development finance, which totaled 161 billion last year, will be aligned with the Paris Agreement. And that declaration includes a number of key commitments. I'll just highlight two. One is further prioritizing adaptation needs of developing countries, including LDCs and small island developing states, and increasing finance uh, for adaptation, um, as well as reducing barriers to accessing that finance. So that's an important commitment. That's an important announcement. And what will be important is to see how that actually changes um, the situation on the ground. Great. Thanks, Kathleen, for some of those concrete examples of what's what's happening with OECD. Uh, so now we are into the Q&A session. And uh, I don't know that we've had any questions submitted so far. Okay, so I just verified no questions so far. I'll, I'll throw one out while we're waiting to see if, uh, if any of those questions do come in. So uh, if we, we talk about meeting you know, people halfway, uh, what, what do the panelists see as a potential 
to use investment uh, for wash services that, that uh, impact the base of the pyramid, but also generate uh, carbon credits or carbon offsets. So we know that the current infrastructure is, is <laughs> in a miserable condition. I, I read a statistic the other day, like something like 4 trillion gallons of water are lost or unaccounted for in the water sector globally, representing about 25% of all the water in the system. It seems like there's a massive, massive carbon footprint associated with that, those water losses that provide no economic good. What do you see as a potential of, as we invest in infrastructure, capturing the carbon offsets and selling those in like a market that is like very short on supply for, for carbon offsets right now? Does anyone want to see how explain how we can do that and get certified yeah if you'd like i can jump in sure <laughs> uh just because we see that um you know some attempts to do this and oftentimes that's looking um at the full water system so you mentioned reducing non-revenue water, which is really important, right? Improving efficiency of the delivery of services that saves energy costs. Obviously that reduces um, uh, uh, emissions vis-a-vis -vis the baseline. I think another example uh, that we see as well, uh, folks who are working on, for example, water funds. Uh, so upstream of water systems, we've heard that already a couple of times, the importance of uh, looking at that full picture and looking um, at securing water supplies. So uh, water funds are a financing approach to protect upstream catchment uh, management and making sure that, that you have secure supply. That's very important for resilient wash systems. And we see some um, you know, interesting emerging um, examples of where those water funds are looking to um, quantify their activities in terms of um, reduced emissions and being able to then use that uh, quantification to be certified, and then accessing um, additional revenue from um, from carbon offsets. So, so that's uh, I would say in, so far an emerging approach. It hasn't been uh, you know completely um, mainstreamed, and of course there are some some issues related to making sure that there's scientific credibility behind that offsetting scheme. But we think that's a very interesting um, approach to explore as well. Great, thanks. Well, thank you. We, in Zimbabwe, in some of our cities, we lose up to 40% of the water, treated water uh, through conveyancing systems that are all dilapidated. And therefore, any saving that can be generated from there would mean that we'll be able to reach more people and improve what we also reduce the cost of pumping. And once we have done that, the wastewater that we generate we just let that flow again. And I think that there are opportunities where we could try and um, more utilize that more, more, more efficiently and, uh, uh, and improve our uh, footprint. I also see an opportunity in most of our rural communities where the conveyancing systems, wherever they exist, uh, are, are very inefficient. They could actually be motivation for communities to uh, look after their catchments, their wetlands much better if we had uh, systems that are able to capture the water more efficiently and be able to distribute it in a more healthy manner. Thank you. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Masuka. Uh, so that, that does bring us to the end. I wanted to hand it back over to Patrick. I think, uh, you know, just to summarize, you know, we're looking at uh, working with water resources and food and energy sectors uh, on this issue. That's important. The wash sector is building this climate rationale, I think, uh, for strong proposals. And that, I think, will lead to more financing. And the, you know, it's important to find, you know, actionable things. Things are tangible so that we can have bankable deals, if you will, for financiers and the private sector to come in. So those are all kind of my takeaways. And Patrick, uh, back over to you. Thank you. Great. And thank you very much, Gary. And thank you, all of our panelists. I think this was a really great kickoff to, to the uh, Wash and Finance Day, Water and Finance Day. I mean, I just uh, like to make there are three quick points in closing on behalf of sanitation and water for all, I, I, and which I think were very much underpinned by what we heard. 
Yeah, one is that investing in climate resilient water, sanitation and hygiene services is a key part of the solution to the global climate crisis, right? It provides an opportunity to policymakers and service providers to rethink access to basic services, to adhere to circular economy and green growth principles. And I think it also helps us to address perennial challenges in water and sanitation, particularly sustainability. Think two, there are important and to date largely untapped opportunities around mitigation by improving water and energy efficiency, by ensuring where possible the use of renewable energy for water and sanitation operations, and also real opportunities to cut the greenhouse gas emissions related to wastewater, as we've just been hearing in excreta disposal, by choosing uh, appropriate types of sanitation and treatment processes. And then thirdly, that as we've seen and discussed during the session, the water, sanitation and hygiene sector is able and should team up with other sectors as well as with financiers to make itself attractive to financiers to work with other sectors to build the adaptive capacity and resilience that's going to be necessary whatever we manage to do on the mitigation front and surely if we can find and tap into such collaborative spirit we can mobilize the necessary climate finance to achieve the Paris goal of mobilizing the 100 billion a year that Kathleen mentioned, and more importantly, to address the pressing mitigation and, and most importantly, I'd say adaptation needs of developing countries. Together we can do it. Thank you very much and uh, have a wonderful rest of your days, wherever you are. Thank you. certain flows, sometimes high water, sometimes low water, to disperse seeds, to trigger fish to spawn. In the 1940s, there were quite a few devastating floods in and around Texas, so there was a lot of dam building that went on in the 50s. There's three primary tributaries to Caddo Lake. Big Cypress is the biggest one and was one of the areas that was impounded to control some dangerous flooding, but they operated it so they would keep a steady level at Caddo. It wasn't immediately obvious what was going on, but over time there was a lot of die off of trees. Fish that were here disappeared. Wetlands were no longer connected to one another. The overall system just wasn't functioning. It's not practical to remove this dam. There would be too much damage to historic towns and population centers, but by tweaking the way they're operated, we can make sure we're balancing the needs of nature with the needs of people. If we can try to recreate Mother Nature within the limits of the dam, what would that look like? What would it take to keep the forest healthy, to try and see more of these specialized fish that should be here to get them back. In this case, we're using the dam more as a tool to put some degree of function back in place. The Corps of Engineers staff took a look at how they operate the dam and looked at our flow recommendations. They adopted a change to work in these flows. What we're seeing out here may not look like much, but this is actually the result of what the Corps of Engineers releasing our prescriptions looks like. This is like the doctor prescribing just what the patient needs. And this is what the river needs. Not only has the Corps been releasing 
these flows, but we've actually put in place the science to see if the ecosystem is responding to that. With even some small changes to how the flows are